Okay. A little better, but. Okay, we're good. Oh, great. Great. Uh, so my name is Gordon, and um, I'm going to be talking about vulnerability management uh, and a flaw that uh, I, I guess I've been working on this for many, many years. And uh, so I guess you can say it's a limitation. Um, but first, um, who has worked with vulnerability management systems? Anyone? Or knows about them? That's okay, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the slide deck and I'm not going to tell you what the flaw is right away, but what I like to do is play a little game. And if you can guess this limitation, just raise your hand and I'll prompt you. And if you get it right, you don't get a prize, but you get recognition. So that's pretty good, right? So I'm Gordon. Um, I actually work for Digital Defense. I'm their CTO. Um, it's located in San Antonio, Texas. So this is my first time to Detroit. Um, I actually uh, was born in Montreal, Canada, so just up the road in, in the you know, Great White North, I guess. So I'm familiar with snow. And I thought, hey, it's a little too cold. I've got to get, uh, get down south, eh? I still got the, the A accent. Anyway, um, I started off my career in uh, Montreal, Canada. Started working for Bell Northern Research as a software developer uh, in telecom and uh, spent maybe five years there. And then I thought, if I'm in telecom, Where's all the action? And I realized that that's in Dallas, Texas. So that's what I did. I moved my family to Dallas, Texas. I actually got a competitive offer, so I started working for a competitor. Nevertheless, it was in telecom, and I spent many years in telecom writing, telecom switching, um, call processing, you know, those kinds of things, many different languages, et cetera. Um, and then around, um, so I love Dallas, spent many years there. Around the year 2002, actually prior to that, telecom started going downhill. And so I looked around. I was actually being laid off. So I was proactive. I knew, I knew it was coming. Our whole project was being laid off. Um, and I found uh, Digital Defense. And I went down for an interview. Um, they wanted to bring me on board to work on, they had a vulnerability management system. So that's part of what we do. We do vulnerability management. We have our own system. Um, there's quite a few patents that we have for this system. Um, and uh, so I, I came on board and worked with four people to redesign the system. It was sort of very archaic, uh, poorly architected, two-tier. Um, so for example, if we needed to change database structure, we would have to change code in many different locations. Um, so I came on board and we redesigned it. And as I was doing this, I realized uh, a certain challenge, uh, and that's what this talks about. So let's move forward. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an overview. I'm going to talk, I'm going to open up the discussion with an information use case to set the stage to give you an idea of what we can use vulnerability management for. Um, I'll talk a little bit about vulnerability management technology background to set the stage. I did a study related to this uh, about a year and a half ago, and I call it the prevalence of network churn. I'm going to actually cover a little bit about that. Um, and then I'm going to reveal the flaw. Maybe by that time you already know what it is. Please raise your hand as we go. I'm going to talk about this consequence, consequences of the flaw, and then wrap up with the conclusion. So here's a use case. So let's assume that um, a new zero day just came out. This is not real. It's hypothetical. Don't go out of this talk saying, Gordon, just you know, reveal the zero day on Apache. That's not what's happening. So assume that a recently announced uh, zero day came out on Apache, but for and, and it impacts 2.4.0 up to the, the 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 release prior to the most recent one, right? So the 2.4.23 is not impacted; you're safe. But prior releases are vulnerable. What would you do if you are a vulnerability management person, and I, I see some of you are? What would you do to find your risk? you would likely run a vulnerability. You probably have been running vulnerability management scans for quite some time, but you'd likely want to find out and baseline, where am I at with this problem, right? So you'd run a recent vulnerability management assessment across your network to find the issue. That's good. but And, and most people will stop there. But there's another thing that you should do, and that is you, you realize that your endpoints may not have this issue today, but in the past they may have had it. For example, 
Maybe you deinstalled Apache at some point, right? So it was there at one point, and a vulnerable version was present in the past, but you won't see that today if you just run a recent scan. Why is that important? It's important because these are candidates where an attacker may have already compromised your endpoint. Maybe you didn't see it. Maybe you didn't have, you know, very in-depth incident response. And so this information would give you some intelligence in terms of where could I look to see potentially I might be, that this is extra intelligence in other words. Does that make sense? So on this hypothetical use case, I, I, uh, this is a diagram that's showing um, where I was vulnerable in the past and where am I vulnerable now. So this is basically just a small network diagram and there's basically two. The red dots show where the vulnerability existed in the past. So this is where Apache, for those vulnerable versions, was present in the past. And the, the vulnerable now is showing us instances, and there's only three dots there, three red dots, instances where I'm today vulnerable. So again, if I just looked at that vulnerable now, which many, many folks would do, they're missing a lot of intelligence, if that makes sense. This is just a diagram to drive home the case that that endpoint that you see right there with the blue lines kind of like drawing across, they're really the same endpoint, okay? I like these little diagrams. I kind of, you know, want to sort of fantasize that I'm in, you know, Back to the Future with Doc when he's on the board and he's drawing, you know, these futuristic diagrams. But anyway, so the, these are, these. this is a different type of timing diagram and I'm sharing it now just because I'm going to be using this kind of diagram as we move forward in this presentation. So the bottom part of the diagram represents the real world assets, the true assets. As an example, that laptop that's on the desk is real. I can go touch it. I know where it is because I can see it. And one, one of the, um, I guess, jobs of a good vulnerability management system isn't just to scan one point in time but to scan that endpoint multiple times across time to re basically you want to understand, well, did I patch this problem? Yes or no? In order to do that, you rescan, right? So vulnerability management or, and scanning isn't like what it used to be in the olden days where you'd pay someone and you'd do a scan one year and then you'd let it go for one year and you'd come back the next year and do another scan. You, you're probably going to scan more frequently, right? So one of the problems or challenges, I guess, that vulnerability management systems have is to relate those two different endpoints as they're scanned across two different points in time to the real world asset. And this diagram showing that that's actually working fine. Um, this is this is just a point in time where I threw some Zen stuff up there. I'm into this kind of stuff, and uh, I'll prompt you. Do you do you know what I'm talking about as far as this flaw? If you do, raise your hand. If not, that's okay. Moving on. So let's talk a little bit about vulnerability management technology, scanning technology. So there's different technologies to scan, right? There's credential-based, there's remote unauthenticated, and then there's agent-based. I'm going to start off with agent-based. There aren't that many solutions out there. They're coming back, I guess, but many solutions in the past used to use what's called agent-based. And then people were worried about, hmm, I got this, you know, piece of software on my endpoint. Is it a rootkit or not? So they were sort of worried about that. But essentially, what agent-based is, is it's a program that's running on your endpoint that's scanning that same endpoint, right? So there's a presence on the endpoint. That's why they call it an agent. It's agent-based scanning. Very accurate um, because it's right on the endpoint. Versus remote unauthenticated, which is scanning technology where the engine, scanning engine, is remote. So I'm just pointing at that projector. I'm pretending that it's a scanner. We have some scanners that actually kind of look like that. And what it will do is it will send messages to the various computers that it's scanning, and based upon the different tests that it's doing and the responses from the endpoint, it will draw conclusions in terms of what vulnerabilities exist on those endpoints. That's remote unauthenticated. Credential-based scanning is sort of a mix between the two, and that is where the engine, the scanning engine, is actually located on a remote device, 
and it authenticates to the endpoints in some form or fashion. And once it's authenticated to that endpoint, you could ask questions. It'll, you know, it could pull the registry keys, it could look at the files, etc. So it's very close to agent based as far as how much it can detect. Um, but it's still remote. So it's kind of a mixture between the two. Pros and cons of these different solutions. Essentially, and I know it's the end of B-sides and you probably want to get going, so I'll, I'll skip over this quickly, but um, agent-based technology is going to have a little bit of an overhead as far as administrative, right? So if you had to go put an agent on every single endpoint, um, if it's Windows-based, maybe it's not that difficult because maybe they're already joined to the domain, but if it's Linux-based, it might be a little more challenging. So key message is it's a challenge to do. Um, it takes a little bit more work than as compared to, say, if you didn't have to use agent base and you were using a, an unauthenticated scanner, for example, right? Um, credential based is a little easier, but you're still going to have to set up credentials and you're going to have to set those credentials up and join, you know, your computers to the domain and those kind of things. And if it's a Linux based system, then you may have to install agents like SSH or, or enable SSH um, in order for the the scanner to actually authenticate to that node. So credential based, um, very accurate findings just as agent based is, but still a little more challenging to deploy as compared to the next one that we're talking about, which is remote unauthenticated. Um, remote unauthenticated, typically organizations will use, and, and all vendors, most vendors will offer a solution that covers Definitely remote unauthenticated, most of them credentialed, some of them now have agents. Um, so there's a mixture of the different three. And organizations, what they'll do as they're scanning is they'll get the system going quickly, their vulnerability management system, they'll scan across the board and, and cast the wide net and perform remote unauthenticated scanning to, you know, to uh, enumerate their devices, find what open ports there are, etc. Um, and they'll do that on a recurring basis. And uh, they'll use credential based or agent based in cases where they know where their, you know, where their critical assets are and they want to put a little more resources. They want to get more information, more information, more insight in terms of the problems and vulnerabilities there. So that's where they would use that. So basically I just talked about those takeaways. Most vulnerability management vendors actually offer multiple different ways of scanning. Unauthenticated scanning is definitely part of that solution. Credential-based scanning, from what I can tell, most vendors have that as well, and some vendors have agent-based. There are a few other techniques, such as passive scanning, um, and if you want, we can talk about that, but I'm going to leave that off to the side right now. Again, most organizations employ remote, unauthenticated scanning to cast the wide net, catch you know the issues, um, and then typically they'll use credential-based scanning for high-risk assets. No hands yet, as far as insight on the flaw. Remember that diagram that I showed you before at the very beginning where I was talking about the challenge of under, like if I'm, if I'm using, if I'm, let's say I'm an organization and I'm running vulnerability scans and I'm doing them every week. The, the system, the vulnerability management system has to relate that endpoint to multiple points in time, week one, week two, week three, week four. So, so the question is, how does it know that that laptop is the same laptop from one scan to the next? And it's important to know because if you discover vulnerabilities on it and in the next week you miss and you mismap it, you're going to conclude that those vulnerabilities have been fixed if that makes sense. That, that's assuming that those two endpoints have nothing in common as far as vulnerability, just to make that uh, statement simple. So how do these technologies actually solve that problem? Um, and so what I did is I, I, I did some research, because we had this challenge as well, and I want to understand, well, well, first of all, we came up with a solution. So we already invested money in, the, in a solution, and then we wondered, did we just waste time? Because it looks like the competitors aren't really worried about this too much. And I looked out into the world and 
one of the largest vendors actually tells you how they do it. You can go on their website, you know, Google, find it, and they'll tell you, this is how we do it. And so I put this up on screen. So they use, and I called it, I called this, um, right, okay, so organizations use one or more network detectable characteristics to match key. What I was talking about, we'll, we'll get on the next slide. Yes, you, you got a point. Yeah, I'm sorry. Actually, I was talking about the next slide, so we'll get to it. But what is that vendor? I really shouldn't say. <laughs> it's Qualys. Yeah, and 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 we'll get to it. But anyway, what they use is you know IP address. For example, if you have a a server that typically won't change its IP address that often, right? If you have a laptop that's sort of moving around a lot, it may, especially if it's in a DHCP environment. So IP address is a very good trackable, I guess, characteristic that you can use to relate two different endpoints across time. But it's not the only characteristic, especially when you're looking at device types like laptops, desktops, those types of things, right? But there are other characteristics that technologies can use. So this is what I was getting at. I kind of missed the slide here. So right, Qualys. This is how they do it. And it's it's not bad because what happens is it's simple. They tell you you have one of three different characteristics, okay, to to be able to solve this problem. And they call this host tracking. That's what they call this problem, host tracking. So if you went to Google, host tracking, Qualys, you'd find this. And as an administrator of the vulnerability management system, once you purchase their solution, you would then go into the portal and you would indicate what tracking mechanism, so you, I call this algorithm, single host tracking key, admin user specifies one of IP address, DNS host name, or NetBIOS host name. So you have three different characteristics to choose from. If you don't do anything, then the default is IP address. So if you purchase that solution and you just want to go start scanning, you can do that. But what happens is after weeks and weeks of scanning, you're going to start seeing mismatches. And you might not even know what's happening. And the reason is because you're matching on IP address by default. And maybe you have laptops that are in DHCP and you know they, they switch their IP. One day you go home, you come back, you get a different IP, you don't really care. The system that's scanning it mismatches it because it's using IP address. So this is analogous to like if you look at your fingerprint, um, you can select like if you want to do fingerprint matching, you can select this is Qualys. You can select one of three different areas on your finger. You have to tell me which one, and then I'll use that to track it. Does that make sense? Question. Right, so you can only select one, but basically you 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 could you give it a, so you basically say I want to use this technique between this range and this range, so IP address A to B I want to use IP address tracking, um, B to C I want to use DNS host name tracking, etc. If that makes sense. So typically, if you're gonna you know if you're worried about tracking laptops, you're probably going to use NetBIOS host name. Um, if otherwise you'd use IPS or sorry IP address matching or DNS host name if that makes sense um, and so I did this study this is what I was referring to I did this study and I wanted to understand well how often do these endpoints change these characteristics the reason that it's important is because for agent-based scanning technology you have a program that's on the computer so you can give it a unique identifier and you don't have this problem. So if you're using agent-based only as part of your scanning solution, this is not a problem. Credential-based, when you authenticate to an endpoint, you could actually drop an ID on that endpoint, a unique identifier. And then the next time you come back and scan another week, you come back and you, and you look to see, well, do I have, did I already scan this in the past? If I did, I should have an identifier there. So you don't really have this issue with credential-based scanning and agent-based scanning. 
Whereas with unauthenticated base scanning, the scanning engine can only solve this problem and match endpoints across time based upon what it sees from these characteristics. Okay? So the question is, how often do these characteristics change? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Yes. You got it. Yes. So what basically he was saying, what was your name? Brandon. Brandon. Okay, what Brandon you just said, and that's good. He, he solved the puzzle. Okay, and we're going over it. We're almost there. And the, the issue that he just described is because these characteristics change more often really than what we believe they changed, and because unauthenticated scanner uses these characteristics to actually match these hosts across time, they're going to be incorrect. They're not always going to be incorrect, but they're going to be incorrect to a certain level. And that level is far more than what we originally believed. In fact, when I looked at this, what, what I worried was that we were just wasting our money because it actually takes time to write, to write software that actually does this kind of almost an analogous to a fingerprint matching, pattern matching. When I was in school, I did one of my final projects was pattern matching algorithms, and so I did some research on it. So when I got to digital defense and I looked at this, I'm like, ooh, this is cool. This is an area where I can you know, use my mathematics skills and I can put this intelligence into software. And so I did. The problem is it's complex, it takes time, and with complex software, you're going to get bucks. So there's ongoing maintenance, and there's like, hmm, you know. The client comes back and says, and, and we knew about this problem, so as we're working with clients, we honed this algorithm as time went on, and it got better and better and better, but nevertheless, it does take money. And if competitors are not worried about it as much, and no clients are complaining about it, then there's economy that you have to kind of look at your solution. So as a software developer in the beginning time, you don't really care about economics. You just want to write some cool stuff. But then as time goes on in your life, you start, you start understanding that there's economics that plays into it. So this is the reason that I wanted to do this study, and so I did. And I found, uh, so what I did is I, I actually subdivided, I did a study and I looked at data to understand how often does, do these endpoints change their characteristics across time. And I looked at different types of endpoints. Server endpoints, client machines like laptops, firewalls, hold on a second, you know, different device types, et cetera, printers, et cetera. And so I'm listing only two different types of devices up here. But I found that even if you're a server type endpoint, those devices change their IP address even. You wouldn't think they would, but they do. 4% of the time across. So this analysis, basically what I did is I looked at assets for internal networks, not external. I did look at external as well, but that's not what this is showing. And I looked across three months, and I declared if the endpoint changes a characteristic at least once across that three-month three time period, that's a hit. And so IP address, I found that IP addresses for servers change approximately 4%. And then there's other characteristics that I listed there. Um, DNS host name changes a whopping 46%. And I, I was confused about that. And they ran it again. And then I went and I talked to some clients in their IT teams to understand what was going on. And I got some good answers to, that validates this. So essentially, these characteristics are changing far more rapid. It might have been that in the olden days, they didn't. But nowadays, with everything that's moving, there's cloud, there's mobile, et cetera, there's a lot more network movement. Um, and so the, the sort of easy solution of how one tracks endpoints across time might have been okay for you know years ago, but nowadays it's not effective enough. Takeaways. Right, so this is basically just showing the same endpoint where its IP address has changed. Um, endpoint changes over time significantly. Right? So bringing it together, 
most widely used scanning technology is remote unauthenticated scanning because it's easy to deploy and it saves money, right? Um, and you don't really need, I mean, if you can do agent-based everywhere and you wouldn't, you know, and it costs just about the same amount of money, then people would do it. But it's going to cost more to do more. So typically organizations are going to cast a wide net with unauthenticated scanning. Most vulnerability management vendors, and I looked at several, uh, track, and I looked at the, the big guys. Point in time scanned endpoints using limited set of remote discovery endpoint characteristics. IP address, DNS host name, net bias host name. Some use MAC address. It's interesting, I, I got a talk, I got a, I got a question at one of, because I delivered this at different B-sides, and my organization thought, hey, why don't you go out, get out of Texas, get out of like, the West or Midwest and go to different parts and, you know, go to these B-sides. And so this is my first time in Detroit and it's cool because I'm learning a lot. I'm seeing different talks here and hopefully you guys haven't seen this one before. But anyway, I digress. Um, most remotely discoverable characteristics are subject to change. I didn't know how much, but the stats show that it's, at least for me, more than, more than I would have thought. The VM flaw is that vulnerability management systems, and really I should say limitation, but I just wanted to be more attractive in a title to put flaw there and hopefully attract more people, often track point in time scan endpoints to incorrect assets. They get it wrong because of this problem. So what does that mean if they get it wrong? Two different types of problems. One is uh, asset duplication and asset mismatch, and we're going to look at these. Right, so here's an example. So in my week one, and I'm showing three endpoints only. In my first week, I have three endpoints. And I have the IP addresses listed, and the DNS host name, and the BIOS host name, and Max, and there's other characteristics, but I listed these four. What happened is, sometime between week one and week two, the red endpoint actually changed its IP address. And so did the yellow one the black endpoint was turned off or it wasn't caught in the scan, right? So in week two, let's assume I, I'm using this Qualys uh, solution and I didn't do anything with it and so I'm tracking by IP address by default. Great. What's going to happen is it's going gonna, it's gonna to declare that that red endpoint is the same as that yellow endpoint, but it's not. And when that happens, uh, you could imagine any, all the vulnerability, assuming that there's no vulnerabilities in common between the yellow and the red asset, it will declare all of the vulnerabilities that it found on the red asset as having been fixed. And it will, of course, declare new vulnerabilities, but hey, if I'm doing some, you know, if I want to show my executive team uh, a little bit of stats, I can see, look at all these vulnerabilities I fixed. Yeah, I got some new ones, but don't worry, I'll take care of them. So mismatching is good, right? No. It's not good. Um, so moving on. Now we're in week 23. So we discovered this problem. Let's say we discovered it. And we're like, darn it, we had a mismatch. This is if you're looking closely. What you would do is you'd say, well, for my red endpoint and maybe a certain range, I'm actually not going to use IP address anymore. I'm going to use um, DNS host name because that's something that I can track on and the vendor allows me to do that. Great. So. Uh, so what happens is, in somewhere between week 23 and 24, um, the DNS endpoint actually changes its name. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, I believe. Um, so anyway, I should be looking on here. Right, so what happens is, the red asset, oh, okay, no, the red asset's actually, so you change the, you change the endpoint to DNS matching. Perfect. Everything looks, everything works great. The scan at week 24 actually matches up, and it could have been, maybe you found it in week 6. So for many weeks, you were matching up correctly using the DNS host name. The red asset matches correctly. Everybody's happy. But one of the problems is, in week, week scan 24, uh, because the yellow endpoint now has the 192.168.40.5 IP address, um, and it is also using IP address matching, the system's going to declare it as a new asset. Many, many vulnerability management systems, that's what they do. They'll declare, look, if I don't see a match, it must be a new asset. 
let's add it to the asset list. So now I have four computers, four endpoints, as opposed to the reality, which is three. And I'll admit, um, even when we actually came out with our algorithm, we had a very large client, and their asset list was sort of jumping. is going up across time. And they're like, hey, what's going on? And we're like, oh, did you guys add new assets? And they're like, no. Well, we added some, but this is crazy. It's going up, it's going up. And we found that we were actually duplicating assets too, even though we had our you know, pretty intelligent algorithm. So we had to hone in, et cetera. Um, so this is just a little Star Wars reference, even though I'm a Star Trek fan. Um, does that make sense so far? Okay. So there are impacts to this. Um, and I'm not going to go over this list, but I will say like a little, you know, there are several, when, there are several prospects that we talk to. And in fact, I've given this talk, uh, the first time I gave it was in Dallas. And there was someone in the audience who came up to me afterwards and he said, that's my problem. And I didn't realize it. Uh, so it's kind of a problem that once, once, you, you, people just assume that it works. I guess is the best way to say it. They, they, they purchase a vulnerability management solution. And why would it not match? I mean, it's just week to week or, you know, every day or whatever. It should just match. They just assume that it does. Um, and then they'll see some issues. But when you have a hundred thousand no endpoints, you're not going to see the little needles in the haystack. Sometimes you will, but you'll be confused. And I mean, I went onto some competitive websites, such as Rapid7, um, Qualys, obviously, and others. And some of these, um, some of these companies have, uh, I guess, if you have a problem, you could actually go onto the website, the forum, and say, hey, what's going on? I don't understand. And it's public. So it's not like, oh, I'm a client, I have access. Yeah, if you want to open a bug, of course. But if you just want to, you know, talk about a problem, you can go onto the community website, whatever it's called. I think Security Streets for Rapid Seven, and you'll pop in a problem, an issue. And if you go searching through there, you're going to see that the people don't understand what's going on. They're they're experiencing asset duplication and, and asset mismatch, but they're 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 communicating their problems in a different way because they don't really know that that's the problem. If that makes sense, right? And sometimes this, the question is, I want to start over. I want to delete all my data from my asset list. How do I do that? That was the question. And the answer is, why do you want to do that? And then they explain what's going on, and I just want to start over. And the conclusion is, ah, you know, this is the issue. Um, obviously, the ideal scan-to-scan -scan endpoint correlation, that's what I call it. I used to call this thing reconciliation because I was like, how do, what, do we, what do we call this problem? And you know, from the quicken days, et cetera, it's like, okay, reconciling accounts, so reconciliation. But people didn't really understand that. Um, and so now I'm calling it scan to scan endpoint correlation. It's a little longer, but people kind of get that a little more because it's like scan to scan, oh, okay. Uh, so the ideal is to obviously match, you know, however you're doing it, match up the right asset to the right endpoint that's scanned across time. So what can you do? Number one, be aware. Be aware of this problem. When, when I talk to people who are evaluating vulnerability management systems, by and large what they're doing is they're running one scan and they're looking to see, did you find these issues? And so they'll, they'll, they'll get three vendors and they'll run one scan. It's, it's sort of like scan from vendor A, scan from vendor B, scan from vendor C. And then whoever gets the most accurate results and there's other, you know, you know, kind of other criteria that go into it, but that's all they're doing. They're, what I'm trying to share is they're not actually looking at what happens if I run scans across time. Do you guys actually have a problem with that? Or are, are you mismatching my assets? Are you really sharing with me what my true risk is? Or at least giving me a good idea of my risk? Because that's what vulnerability management systems are supposed to do, right? And the risk isn't just one point in time scan. 
the risk is communicated to you, and, and th this plays back to the use case that I shared at the beginning. It's not just one point in time scan. You have to look at the past. You have to be able to go into your vulnerability management system and query it and say, wow, I have scans across time. I want to understand what happened three weeks ago. And to do that, it has to map correctly. And if it doesn't, you have a problem. So this is the wrap up. Um, I just alluded to it again, historical security information is key to risk intelligence. Um, again, it's not just one point in time scan. You've got to query your system, look back in the past. How well are you doing? Are we improving? Are we at a sort of steady state? Um, and then the use case that I shared in the beginning, you'd only be able to solve that if you had good matching across time. Endpoints change uh, their characteristics due to normal IT administration. It's not like rocket science. It's just the IT people are moving printers around, they're changing things, things are breaking, so they're changing the IPs. Darn it, we changed, we changed the printer. People aren't going to be happy, but they're going to do it anyway. Um, and then they'll solve the problems later. So when selecting a vulnerability management system, evaluate scan-to-scan -scan correlation capability. Um, that is all I have. Questions? Say again? Yes, um, Nessus, Qualys, um, the Tenable one, Security Center. They do. Um, so um, I guess they have an algorithm that they don't really publish, publish so you kind of have to discover what it is. Um, and with Security Center, it's my understanding that they actually take in data feeds from, for example, DHCP. So that actually helps. And their algorithm's hands off. It's like, on the one hand, Qualys is, you could say, oh, I don't like it because I have to actually get involved. Like, I have to go actually indicate how, how do I want to match. But on the other hand, it's flexible because if you miss, if it mismatches, you could change it and it corrects the past, by and large. There's some issues with it, but. It actually goes back, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I found Security Center wasn't, it, it wasn't like a perfect algorithm, but it was, from what I can tell, better than Qualys. Is that what you're using? Oh, okay. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Maybe we should talk more. So, good stuff. Any other questions? Static IP addresses? So, right. So, that's what I'm sharing is when, when we say, oh, okay, this, this computer has a static IP address. Like, in large organizations, you, typically what's happening is you have your IT teams, and you may have more than one team, and then you have typically a centralized security team that's kind of responsible for scanning the entire organization, and then they'll go to them and say, hey, we need you to remediate this, and there's issues with that. But I guess to answer your question, nothing's really static. I mean, it's static for a certain amount of time until, until they decide, well, I'm going to change the IP address for whatever reason. They'll, they'll, it'll still be static, but it'll be a different one. So for a certain set of weeks, it's, it's this IP address, and then someone comes in and says, I'm going to change this printer or whatever. I'm going to do something with it. And it's, oh, now it has a different IP address. Okay, let's go communicate that to the world, etc. But it's not like a situation where static is static forever. And that's what my study found. Is I, I, I assumed it would be more static than what I found, I guess is the best way to say it. But um, it's not. Yes, that's what I'm thinking too. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yes, excellent point. Yes. Yeah. Anyone else? 
All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.